I will not live again, so I need to live in peace. I will appeal to the earth and the sky and all that is alive, because I want to live in peace. Pope Francis has said, allow me to draw attention to particularly vulnerable groups of migrants, exiles, and refugees whom we are called to welcome, to protect, to promote, and to integrate. For over 65 years, the International Catholic Migration Commission, or ICMC, has upheld these four principles by serving women, children, and men who have been forced to leave their homes. ICMC protects the dignity and rights of uprooted people, regardless of their faith, race, ethnicity, and nationality, providing them with assistance, helping them to rebuild their lives, and finding a place to call home. Its story begins in the aftermath of World War II. Pope Pius XII founded ICMC in 1951 to form a worldwide network of Catholic Church-inspired responses to the needs of thousands of people displaced during the war. 
ICMC was soon granted consultative status at the United Nations, enabling it to collaborate with other agencies responding to migration challenges. One of ICMC's greatest accomplishments started in 1979, when over a 20-year period, ICMC resettled 500,000 Vietnamese, Cambodian, and Laotian refugees, mainly to the United States, and ran important education and health programs in refugee camps in Southeast Asia. Responding to diverse needs in the late 1980s, ICMC started expanding its service to include Latin America, assisting displaced people through agricultural projects and legal documentation, Africa, providing food, shelter, and resettlement opportunities to the most vulnerable in Angola, Eritrea, Ethiopia, and Mozambique, the Middle East, offering psychological support to women and children uprooted by war, and providing humanitarian relief commodities, cash assistance, and healthcare services. In the 1980s and the 1990s, ICMC helped ethnic and religious minorities fleeing the violence in former Yugoslavia to find new homes overseas. It also supplied social and economic support to refugees returning and rebuilding livelihoods in their homeland in the Balkans. For over 30 years, ICMC has partnered with the U.S. government to assist refugees through the Resettlement Support Center in Istanbul, one of ICMC's largest operations. In the past 10 years alone, over 60,000 refugees were resettled to the USA with the help of ICMC. In 1998, ICMC launched a partnership with the UNHCR to create a deployment scheme that sends experts to UNHCR field offices to help identify and prepare refugees for their move to a new life. Migrants and refugees frequently face abuse, exploitation, and exclusion. Created and led by ICMC, the Global Migration and Development Civil Society Network, MADE, organizes civil society leaders and networks worldwide to advocate for rights-based policies benefiting migrants of all kinds. Since 2011, ICMC has coordinated the Civil Society Days of the Global Forum for Migration and Development, promoting agendas of positive change. ICMC works with governments and international organizations to create safe and legal pathways for persons fleeing violence and persecution, to find refuge, protection, and family unity in other countries. ICMC's work is also nurtured by the activities of its members, a worldwide network of Catholic bishops' conferences engaged in migration and refugee services and advocacy, exchanging best practices and informing policy agendas at the international and national levels. As governance of global migration evolves, ICMC continues to respond to the needs of uprooted people and their communities in every region of the world. Restoring Dignity Inspiring change. The day I live will not be repeated. My life will not be repeated. I want to live in peace. I'd like to start out uh, the reflection by looking at the global context of people forced to the move throughout the world. Of course, many people volunteer to be on the move, as I myself have done many times in my life, for purposes of study and both pastoral and professional missions. And I suspect that several of you have made the same voluntary choices to migrate. The situation of those who are forcibly displaced, however, 
rightfully needs to be prioritized for our consideration and action. So let's begin this reflection by observing and feeling the dimensions of forced displacement among our sisters and brothers, as reported in May 2022 by the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. The number of displaced refugees increased by 8% during that year. By the end of 2021, those displaced by war, violence, persecution, and human rights abuses stood at 89.3 million, up 8% from a year earlier, and well over double the figure of 10 years ago. Since then, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, causing the fastest and one of the largest forced displacement crises since World War II, and other emergencies from Africa to Afghanistan and beyond, pushed the figure over the dramatic milestone of 100 million displaced people. During 2021, the number of refugees increased to 27.1 million. Most refugees were hosted by neighboring countries with few resources. The number of asylum seekers reached 4.6 million, up 11%. And 2021 also saw the 15th straight annual increase in people displaced internally within their own home countries by conflict to 53.2 million internally displaced people. Welcoming the stranger, an ancient and universal social value. Refugees have been accorded special protection status from time immemorial. In ancient Greece, citizens whose safety was threatened in their place of origin were welcomed and granted protective status. Thus, the concept of asylum was developed. The latter was codified into international law. In more modern times, many of the world leaders emerging from the atrocities and tragedies of the First and Second World Wars expressed determination to avoid such loss and damage to the sacredness of human life and dignity in the future. Regrettably, their hopes and dreams were not fully achieved since hundreds of wars and civil conflicts have occurred since 1945 and still are occurring. However, the international community, especially the United Nations organization and some regional and intergovernmental organizations, such as the Organization for, of African Unity, have developed international legal instruments to promote and monitor respect for the rights of refugees and migrants. In some cases, their instruments represent binding obligations for signatory governments. In other cases, they have been developed as guidelines for practice and depend on the political will of the associated governments. Regrettably, we are living in an era when some of these ancient and universal values are under serious threat. Some countries are refusing entry to those who wish to present an asylum claim. Others are interdicting those vulnerable persons at sea and sending them to uninhabitable offshore and distant islands. Others are claiming that all new arrivals are really economic migrants, even though they have not examined the individual and family situations to determine whether or not such persons have a credible fear of persecution or life-threatening circumstances. This is how, in a 2016 report, the former UN Secretary General of the United Nations described the plight of modern-day refugees and migrants. I quote, rickety boats piled high with people seeking safety. Women, men, and children drowning in their attempts to escape violence and poverty. Fences going up at borders where people used to cross freely and thousands of girls and boys going missing, many falling prey to criminal gangs. Upon arrival, those who survive these perilous trips are often violated. Many asylum seekers and migrants are detained and their reception is sometimes far from welcoming. Xenophobic and racist rhetoric seems to be not only on the rise, but also becoming more socially and political, politically accepted. Welcoming the stranger, an ancient religious value. The Jewish people were instructed in the book of Exodus, you shall not oppress a resident alien. You well know how it feels to be an alien, 
since you were once aliens yourselves in the land of Egypt. The book of Leviticus turned this principle into Jewish law. You shall treat the alien who resides with you no differently than the natives born among you. You shall love the alien as yourself. St. Paul warned, do not neglect hospitality, for through it, some have unknowingly entertained angels. In his first encyclical, Deus Caritas Est, the late Pope Emeritus, Benedict XVI, made the point that the early Christians were inspired to expand the Old Testament concept of neighbor from one's own family or physical neighbors or members of one's own tribe to all members of the known human family. During the Middle Ages, even the secular authorities recognized the sacred status of sanctuary and did not violate the rights of those who sought refuge in monasteries or churches. The ancient religious teachings and traditions provide us present-day believers with the foundation of our efforts to provide protection, humanitarian assistance, integration into first countries of asylum, and resettlement to third countries for people whose lives and future are in danger because of their national, ethnic, religious, political, or socioeconomic and cultural background. Papal teachings during the 19th, 20th, and 21st centuries have further developed both the doctrinal and the practical foundations for our response to refugees, forced migrants, internally displaced people, and survivors of human trafficking. Pope Francis's commitment to defending the rights and dignity of migrating people speaks loudly to both world leaders, whether they agree with him or not, and to all people of goodwill. I frequently tell my ICMC staff that I consider him to be the best public relations guru that I could find, and we don't even have to pay him one single penny. And I say that with deep respect and appreciation, and with the belief that in an examination of the Pope's communication style can teach us volumes about how to shape our own social and media messages on this sensitive and controversial topic of, that's capable of toppling or securing political power in many countries. Here is a special roadmap for response to refugees and migrants that Pope Francis developed for the Catholic Church's observance of World Monday of Migrants and Refugees in 2018. And it was this that helped the Holy See and Catholic inspired organizations like our own to shape our negotiations with states uh, in relation to the development of the Global Compacts for Refugees and for Safe, Regular, and Orderly Migration, both of which were approved by an overwhelming majority of UN member states later that same year. The Pope calls members of the Catholic Church and all people of goodwill to solidarity with all persons forced to leave their homelands in search of a better future. This solidarity, he adds, uh, I quote, must be concretely expressed in every stage of the migratory experience, from departure through journey to arrival and return, and to do so with generosity, promptness, wisdom, and foresight, each according to their own abilities. The action-oriented framework proposed in this message of the Holy Father challenges Catholics and other people of goodwill to, I quote, welcome, protect, promote, and integrate migrants and refugees, knocking at the doors of national boundaries and local communities. This Pope never hesitates to show his respect for the dignity and rights of forced migrants and his sorrow and solidarity in the face of the pain, suffering, and loss that they so often are forced to endure. He has been especially active in his advocacy for peace in Ukraine, and in many of the other protracted and all too often forgotten conflicts that rage in all parts of the world. He insists that peace can only be reached by respectful dialogue and frequently has offered his own direct involvement in mediation efforts related to the war in Ukraine. Here is only one of his constant pleas for peace in this regard. I quote, every day I carry in my heart the dear and tormented Ukraine, which continues to be scourged by barbaric attacks. I pray that this insane war may soon see an end, and I renew the invitation to persevere without tiring in prayer for peace, 
May the Lord open those paths of dialogue that men are unwilling or unable to find, and I'm sure he meant to say also men and women. And let us neglect to come to the end of the Ukrainian people, to the end aid of the Ukrainian people who are suffering so much. So too, he has urged active humanitarian and pastoral responses on the part of the Catholic-inspired organization to displace people in Ukraine and Ukrainian refugees in neighboring as well as faraway countries. These appeals always are accompanied by his equal concern for forced migrants in every other part of the world. The pain of war in Ukraine. In many ways, this is a truly a war that's being fought before our very eyes in the Western world. Hourly news updates are available on many of the major news stations. I am afraid this constant reportage risks reactions of numbness and boredom rather than the urgent concern that we all should show toward our Ukrainian sisters and brothers. But please allow me to share with you the most recent impact summary from weekly briefing documents that are being prepared by our ICMC colleague who is coordinating our organization's response in this country. Refugees from Ukraine recorded across Europe, 8 million. Refugees from Ukraine registered for temporary or similar national protection schemes in Europe, 4.8 million. Number of people in need of humanitarian assistance in Ukraine, 17.6 million. Civilian casualties, 7,000 killed, including 338 children, and 11,000 injured, including 576 children. <coughs> Women and children who make up 90% of people fleeing the crisis are at risk of gender-based violence and sexual exploitation and abuse. As the war stretches out, integrating long-term actions focusing on protection of women and children to mitigate their vulnerabilities to the conflict is recognized as a priority that should be complementary to provided basic needs. Catholic Response for Ukraine Working Group, CR4U. In early March 2022, just two weeks after the Russian invasion of the sovereign territory of Ukraine, and at the encouragement of Vatican officials, the representatives of major global Catholic-inspired humanitarian organizations formed this working group to coordinate their actions in the affected regions, Ukraine, Poland, Hungary, Slovakia, Moldova, and Romania. The guiding principle for the coordination efforts is based on cultivating dialogue with the first-line actors as well as the global-level organizations. This effort is not intended to interfere with the initiatives or the fundraising undertaken by the respective working group members, but rather to promote sharing of humanitarian information, successes, challenges, and to identify gaps and discern which organizations might be able to respond effectively to such needs. The members of the working group include my own, ICMC, and we were asked to convene this working group as the president. In Car Caritas Internationalis and Caritas Europa, the international Catholic charities organizations, Jesuit Refugee Services International and JRS Europe, the Sovereign Order of Malta and Malteser International, DePaul International, Knights of Columbus, and the Catholic Health Association of the United States. The working group produces weekly updates on the situation in Ukraine and surrounding countries featuring responses by the UN and other multilateral organizations, as well as that of working group members, other Catholic-inspired faith-based and non-governmental organizations, and other pertinent networking information and resource materials. Convenings of the members are held regularly and include presentations by various resource persons, as well as updates by the members and by Vatican officials and first responders at field level. Challenges that have been reported by the working group members, supporting and caring for the caregivers, ensuring staff well-being in the face of physical and psychological fatigue, logistical difficulties in reaching people in need in eastern and southern Ukraine, challenging regulatory environment within Ukraine, dealing with bureaucracy and corruption, limited humanitarian capacity within Ukraine, Maintaining income pipeline to continue supporting those in need. 
readiness and openness of those in need to be helped, diversity of priorities within the local church, fluidity of the situation as far as migrants are concerned, banking services in Ukraine, specifically issues with incoming wires, accommodating in-kind donations from foreign partners, as well as requests for media and visit availability put additional strain on the local staff that's trying to serve the people most in need. And then access to timely information to conflict areas. <coughs> Some of the major gaps and needs that they reported were winterization support, including short-term repair to damage infrastructure, inflation, energy, and security. Mental health and psychosocial support and counseling for refugees and internally displaced people. Education of displaced children, contact with the refugees within the EU, implementation of safeguarding and protection policies, data gathering on services provided to beneficiaries to avoid duplication, and then availability of emergency and cash assistance to refugees and IDPs, especially large families and pregnant women who might become victim to predatory human trafficking, forced abortion, or exploitative labor situations. Witnessing the pain of war in Ukraine and bringing a message of solidarity and care. In early July 2022, together with ICMC colleagues, I undertook a solidarity mission to Ukraine in order to assure our sisters and brothers there of our deep concern and our commitment to respond to their needs to the fullest extent possible. We initiated our journey in Krakow fully where we saw the long lines of mothers and babies and elderly grandparents who had been waiting in the hot sun for hours to access food and personal hygiene products. I heard them anxiously sharing their, their fears of uh, that nothing would be left on the shelves uh, or that the store would close before they made it to the front of the line. Then I was invited to peek in and see the mostly empty shelves. I asked myself how such vulnerable people could be forced from their homeland and be subjected to an uncertain future. But then I was inspired by the volunteers who patiently reassured the refugees, compassionately absorbed their complaints, and smiled with those refugees leaving with the supplies that they so desperately needed. <coughs> we then visited large convents of the Daughters of Charity of St. Vincent de Paul and of the Sisters of Mercy in Poland both of which hosted upwards of 500 refugees each day since the invasion of Ukraine. The children tugged at our, tugged at our heartstrings as they proudly counted in Polish their new language that they were learning, uh, sang a hymn of hope and praise to God despite their worries about the fathers they left behind in Ukraine to serve in the military, whose lives were in danger each and every day. Their paintings showed us the true story of worries and fears, but they also featured rays of sunlit hope as they imagined a new Ukraine that could enjoy peace and security once again. And these were paintings being done by three and five years old. We traveled by slow and much delayed train to Szymczyl, Poland. There at the local seminary, which was also hosting refugees, we were generously offered a ride over the border by the Latin Catholic Archbishop of Lviv. Shortly after crossing the border, we stopped at a newly constructed abbey of Benedictine monks. Within weeks after the arrival of the monks in their new home, they were joined by some 18 Benedictine sisters who had to flee the capital city of Kiev due to the repeated bombings at the beginning of the war. It is kind of coincidental that today is the feast of Saint Scholastica who was the founder of the Benedictine Sisters, and her, her brother, Benedict, was the founder of the Benedictine monks. Then some 150 more displaced persons arrived. The abbot of the monastery reminded us that they were given a mandate of ora et labora, work and pray and work, by their sixth century founder, St. Benedict. This abbot shared with us that since welcoming so many refugees, the community's timetable for prayer is often disrupted. And then with a twinkle in his eye, he said, well, you know, we have to be Christians first and then be monks second. We also traveled to ivano Frankitsk, where many people sought welcome as their home cities and villages under constant bombardment uh, in the east or were just no longer habitable. 
I was introduced as a so-called important visitor, but I told the displaced persons that we had come to learn from them and that I had no real speech to give to them. I wanted to listen. They expressed their gratitude to the local church for having been received with such gentle care. One woman pointed out that the food and shelter was not enough since they needed to have ease their hearts and their souls and they said they found that kind of care at the seminary where they were welcomed. In this city, we revisited a monastery of Passionist priests, which also had opened its doors to displaced Ukrainians, mostly, again, women and children. One woman, Elena, spoke about how one of the priests carried her disabled mother up and down the steps since she was too weak to walk. She had since died. Elena also expressed gratitude that she had been able to keep her pet dog in the monastery, since she said, after all, the dog is a refugee also. The women from the local parish were joined by the displaced women, yes, as they baked 600 loaves of bread each day in the monastery kitchen. And the fruits of their labors, in turn, were shared with facilities sheltering other displaced people in other parts of the city. The fruits of their, that they, this indeed was the modern miracle of the multiplication of the loaves. Their host, a young passionate, pre, passionate priest, told me that he had been ordained only one week free previously, but now is coordinating this huge operation of service and comfort for people traumatized by war. I shared with him that I had just observed the 50th anniversary of my priestly ordination. We embraced and promised to pray for each other as we continue our prayers for peace in Ukraine and our respective service to its people. Upon our return to the, from the visit of Ukraine, we at ICNC decided to avoid opening any direct operations there. At the strong recommendation of the Papal Nuncio to Ukraine, we have sought partnership with dioceses, religious orders, and Catholic-inspired organizations, which have, have expressed the need to access funds to meet immediate humanitarian needs, including medications, special nutritional needs, heating facilities and shelters located in the mountains and formerly used, that were formerly used as vacation spots during the summer seasons. We also partnered with both Greek Catholic and Latin Catholic seminaries to train the clergy on how to be sensitive to trauma and emotional turmoil among the faithful who often present themselves for spiritual care, but also need more professional psychosocial services. Within, with the U Ukrainian Knights of Columbus, we're now partnering to provide intensive psychological trauma treatment to returning military and their spouses so that they could resume a more harmonious family life. The sights, sounds, and feelings experienced during our solidarity pilgrimage were not always easy to encounter. But the tenacity and resilience of these forcibly displaced people renewed my faith in the human dignity that God granted to each of them, despite the suffering and the loss to which they have been subjected. And I'm now preparing for a second pilgrimage to Ukraine uh, that I'll take uh, during the first weeks of March. I'll end this reflection with another plea from Pope Francis for a true and lasting peace in Ukraine and in all areas fractured by conflict and violence. I quote, the plea for peace cannot be suppressed. It rises from the hearts of mothers. It is deeply etched on the faces of refugees, displaced families, the wounded, and the dying. And this silent plea rises up to heaven. It has no magic formula for ending conflict but it does have the sacred right to implore peace in the name of all those who suffer, and it deserves to be heard. End of quote, and thank you very much. So I think we have some time. I know Lynn and, and Peter are keeping track of timing, but um, uh, maybe if you have some questions, I know some people uh, and microphones that you want to Okay. All right. Just, I think raise hands. Just, okay. just be clear. I'm trying my best to hear you with my, my hearing aids, too. <laughs> so. Yes. Yeah. Maybe if you come up front and, and use the microphone. Okay, so.
so my name is Benedetta, I'm part of the social work school here. And thank you for sharing with us all that to do. My question is about housing. Like I, I understood from your talk all the immediate you know, support and holding that you do and the stabilization and all this action. And I would like to know a little bit more about what happens next like with you, with the people you go, the other organizations. Thank you, and it's good to see another post social worker. I didn't go to BC School of Social Work, but I did go to Fordham, so <laughs> we're somewhat related. Um, it, this was a constant theme that we heard from the people as we visited, and, and really what happened was that a lot of um, uh, student you know, schools, uh, seminaries, um, and some hospitals just opened up whatever room they had. And, and a lot of the, the priests and the sisters moved out of their, their own rooms and gave these rooms to the uh, to this place people. But a big issue, this was summertime when I was there, and a big issue was that the Ukrainian government wanted to restart the school system in September. And so they were very afraid that they would be, you know, completely uh, uh, let out into the streets. Uh, that's not happening, but it still uh, it still is a, a big worry because they uh, they know they need some stability. First of all, most of the people, uh, both those who are refugees in nearby countries and the ones who are displaced in, in Ukraine, they want to go back home. Although I, I um, uh, in one of those uh, uh, one of the photos that you'll see in the talk, I think they they distributed the talk because we knew we couldn't do PowerPoints in this room. Uh, but um, uh, I'm there looking for the woman and her husband uh, showing me the destroyed home, that uh, photos of her destroyed home. And she won't be able to go back there. That's that's one of Zaporizhia, so it's probably gonna take decades before they can rebuild that city. So they're still very worried about this. Um, the church is doing its best to serve them, but of course they're crowded. Uh, uh, circumstances and uh, and they need some sense of permanence uh, and that is one of the things we we also we in the in the global community are looking forward to peace so that we can at least begin to work with the Ukrainians to rehabilitate the structure the infrastructure but right now it doesn't look like it's coming too soon um, however uh, also there's a lot of movement um, you know many of the uh, people who did go to the nearby countries are going back and forth because they had to leave some of their disabled uh, relatives and their elderly relatives they, who couldn't make the trip to another country. And I can tell you, I was on the trains going into Lviv and coming out of Lviv, and uh, you know they're tremendously crowded. It's hard to work your way through them, and then you have long queues, which I had to stand in too when I was going back into Poland or coming into Ukraine. So uh, it's, it's still a very, very big problem. Um, and we just have to help them, you know. But I, I also have to balance this out too, because um, I, I want to give a lot of attention and priority to the Ukrainians. But also, there are many, many refugees that we're working with, for instance, in Turkey and in Lebanon, and we're, we're processing their resettlement applications to the United States. And, you know, some of them have been there for seven to 10 years without an answer. Some of them have even been interviewed by the US government officials in addition to all the work we've done with them, and they still don't have an answer. So this is, this is not unusual, but it's a horrible situation for people to live with. Other questions, comments? I hope I didn't make you all so tired. <laughs> Yes, Peter. Could you, uh, could you talk about the um, logistical issues in working with some different organizations to coordinate this effort and, uh, you know, really in the leads, what are the challenges of that process? Thank you, Peter. That's, that's really a, a good question to raise, and it's one that we've had to struggle with because, as I said, it would have been easier for us to send you know, a whole bunch of uh, people who are used to this kind of work uh, and to kind of take over. Uh, but I wanted to respect the, the, the church in Ukraine. Uh, and so uh, we decided not to do our own direct operations. Uh, but we also had the generous support from a Catholic-inspired foundation here in the United States that, that helped me at least to employ someone. And, uh, and this man is a, is a Ukrainian and American. Uh, he's lived, you know, 
much of his life in Ukraine, but also he knows the uh, the more Western ways of uh, of accountability too. And so he's been you know a tremendous resource for us to be able to talk directly in their own language with uh, uh, with the Ukrainian church people, understanding the culture. His father is a Ukrainian Greek Catholic priest. The Greek Catholics are allowed to marry, uh, not a lot of Catholics like us, uh, but. Um, uh, so it's been he's been a tremendous resource and, and he really helped me then you know uh, understand the situation well make decisions about what kind of funding we'll get and and with him I have the surety that we'll get the right kind of reporting and monitoring that we have to give back to the uh, the people who are donating to us uh, but it's 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 a it's a choice you have to make uh, uh, many organizations send uh, mostly expatriate staff uh, in these kinds of humanitarian problems, but then they don't have the culture and they don't, they don't, they're not able to really communicate with the people who are, who are being affected. And so um, even in our big programs, most of the time we hire local staff and we have maybe one expatriate person who's doing the, the management. And I think that's, that's a wise way to do it, even though it's more complex. Yes, please. Thank you, Monsignor, for being with us today. Thank you for your story and your mission. Um, I have a question. So for my generation, the Ukrainian war um, is pretty unique in that we're witnessing it on cable news and also on social media. Um, I know there are a lot of teenagers who are refugees right now who are sharing their life experience on TikTok, for example. Um, and I know a lot of young people really want to give aid to Ukrainian refugees. What are some ways that we, being here in Boston, could help uh, Ukrainian refugees? Is it calling Congress, um, donations to ICMC or other causes, um, prayers? What would you recommend? All of the above. <laughs> um, first of all, uh, you're very right that this is being uh, this is being played out before our very eyes. Um, I mean, I remember I grew up uh, when I was already studying in, in university, you know, when the Vietnam War was going on, as we called it. Uh, and, uh, and they were kind of like nightly news reports, but you didn't have every, every second during the day cable news, you know, reporting on this. And there are advantages, but I think some disadvantages as well. Um, at the same time, if you were speaking to a Ukrainian, they would remind you, as they did to me several times, that this war started in 2014 when Russia invaded and took over the Crimea, Crimea which had been a separate part of Ukraine for many years. Uh, and so, um, you know, they, they see this as a continuation of a war. Uh, I was in Ukraine uh, shortly after that 2014 invasion. And, and, but I have to admit, I really didn't get the impact. I, I was still thinking and, and hearing with Western, uh, you know, my brain and ears. Uh, and it's not only till now that I see that this is a continuing war. And for them, this is survival. This is their, uh, their autonomy. This is their sovereignty. And so, uh, you know, that's why some people uh, say to me, well, why don't they just stop the war? You know, I mean, it's just, it's hurting them too. Why don't they just stop it and, and give up the Crimea too? Um, it's, it's really very hard for us to be able to give them advice on that. Um, I think in terms of what they need are many things. One is if you want to get involved locally. Uh, I know that there are some Ukrainians coming to the United States. Obviously, a lot of them want to stay closer to their homeland because they want to go home. Uh, but there are Ukrainians coming, and I believe that even Boston Catholic Charities is, is serving them. So you may want to check with Red Cross and, and Catholic Charities. Uh, I'm prejudiced, but uh, uh, you know, uh, to see if you could do something with them here. Um, if you want to donate for you know, the work that's going on in Ukraine and, and with others, um, I, I put ICMC at the top of this, but, uh, and, and I have one of, uh, we have our development uh, uh, um, uh, officer, Bill Bagley, here with us. Uh, so uh, he's based here in, in Boston. Uh, you could call our office, International Catholic Migration Commission, ICMC Inc., and we're at 31 Milk Street. You can even stop there uh, and say hello. Um, but uh, you know, we certainly are accepting donations, uh, 
and um, and uh, you know, there's you can go to our website. There's a place we we have kind of donate signs almost on every landing page, but uh, uh, and that will bring you to a place where a secure site where you can donate with a credit card, or you can send uh, a check or, or drop off some money to to us in Boston as well. Uh, other places, um, you know, certainly Jesuit Refugee Services is uh, uh, is a is a very reputable uh, organization uh, internationally, and they are very active. When I was in Ukraine, I visited with the uh, the Jesuit who's in charge there, and they 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 are receiving refugees in their own home as well. Um, the and then also Catholic Relief Services, which is the American Bishops Overseas uh, Relief and Development Organization. Um, I haven't seen that as active in Ukraine, but they're very active in some of the countries that are receiving the refugees, especially in, in Romania and in Moldova. Okay, great. Yes, please come. Thank you. Great question. And how many hours do we have left that I can talk about that? But um, it, it's it's different in, in many different places. One, one issue is that there is such um, resistance to migrants and refugees. I don't have to tell you about that, because you're hearing that in the United States all the time. And it, it really hurts my heart uh, because my grandparents came from Italy and they were accepted, so why can't we realize how much they were to fill this country with many other immigrants and refugees? Uh, so, uh, but, but that is the situation here. In Europe, uh, again, a lot of resistance and the thought that there are these waves and waves and you know, people who are gonna take over our culture or our country. And yet, you know, as I mentioned, most of the refugees are being served in poor countries like the ones they're fleeing from, you know, or countries in, in Turkey. You have, you have countries in Africa that are both sending and receiving countries of refugees. Uh, so I think, you know, um, that, that's an issue, the attitude of the people. Uh, and, uh, you know, what we try to do in many of our uh, humanitarian assistance programs is that we always keep a certain percentage of our funds to serve the local people who are poor or who are displaced in their own country. Uh, so that, I hope, helps with some of this kind of prejudice against why you're doing so much for the refugees when we have needs as well. Um, uh, in other cases, it's um, the governmental structures. I mean, we recently, we had a huge program in Pakistan, and we were supplying the only medical assistance uh, to the camps uh, along the Pakistan-Afghanistan border. And last year, we were thrown out by the government because they don't want international organizations anymore, and because we refused to pay bribes. So, you know, those are some of the things you deal with, and, you know, we have to move out if they say no. But we did many appeals, we tried our best, but we're not there anymore. Uh, we did our best to try to hand over to local organizations the work that we were doing, but we don't have any information about what's happening there. Um, and then there's the, the kind of legal bureaucracy. A lot of our work is done with the United Nations, which I have deep faith and trust in as the United Nations, especially in their mission and mandate when they were starting in the, uh, in, First, right after the World War One, and then later uh, World War II. Um, but it's a bureaucratic, you know, tremendous bureaucracy. And so, for us to make applications, and and in, you saw in the video, we actually deploy legal experts and protection experts to work with them because it takes them so long to get on new staff in emergencies. And yet, it's almost like we're, they're doing us a favor to to have us do them as their work for them. So. You know, those are all some of the, the frustrations that we get. But nothing is like, you know, being able to know the thankfulness of the people that you're serving and the hope they have. Like I said, there's great resilience in, among refugee and migrant populations with, that I've talked with and that I've learned from, from every part of the world. Uh, so I, I don't want to have those obstacles and those frustrations in any way seem like it's greater than the, the wonderful work that's done and the gratefulness of the people uh, that you do the work with. And then to see them actually work hard in the countries. I'll give you one last example. In Greece, 
Uh, we also we, uh, send uh, legal experts, and we've been um, we've been uh, also sending experts to help local communities in Greece integrate the refugees. Because most of the, brief, uh, the refugees from Syria, Iraq, who came to Greece came thinking they were going to go to Northern Europe, and they haven't moved. And so now some of them are saying, okay, we stay here. And we've been helping them do that. Recently, one of those towns where we were assisting them um, was uh, had a terrible flood. And the refugees came out to help the locals clean up their mess uh, of the flood. And that helped the locals realize that they're here to help us as well. Yes. Thank you, Monsignor. My question actually on that the integration that you talked about in Greece, because one of the things that seems unique in the Ukrainian um, refugee crisis is that this is still you know, seen as a temporary thing. And so my question is, how do you sort of balance that tension of maybe offering migrants or providing opportunities for integration in the communities that they find themselves in? while also holding on to that hope that this will be a temporary situation. Again, great, great points. Um, for the Ukrainian situation, I think there's just not a psychological space for them to see this as permanent right now. And, and I saw that in many, many other refugee groups that I've worked with over the years. Um, after a while, uh, either the situation uh, doesn't go the way they want it, like in Vietnam, um, or you know, or they just see there's no no real hope to go get home soon. The Syrians, you know. Uh, uh, so I, I think then then they're more open to integrating. But then we have to make sure we have the welcoming communities, you know, uh, to be able to do that and to be respectful. And uh, you know, the Pope talks about how integration is a two way street. It's us doing for them, but it's also us receiving from them and being and, and acknowledging that. And I think that's what we have to always uh, bring out. Um, in Europe, uh, we're, we're placing a lot of refugees now in rural villages because Europeans are dying. They're, they're not making babies enough. So, you know, they're, and so uh, we, we place, for example, a number of refugees uh, in French villages, mountain villages, where the, the bakeries have closed. And now they're reopening the bakeries and the French could have their pockets again. You know, nice and hot, and pulling it off the the, the heel off the, the bread, and, and and I think that makes them appreciate. It. Uh, so those are the kinds of things you have to look for and be creative on this. Monsignor, um, on behalf of Boston College, I'd like to offer you just a warm expression of our gratitude for your profound work and your your deep grace, and it's obvious that you are driven by the Spirit. And the world needs you. We thank you so much. Thank you.